Good morning. Good morning. In the talk on Saturday and on Sunday, a subject opened that came into fuller fruition last night. And I think that it started in my sleep and awakened me, and then in a half-sleep it continued to unfold. You remember several things were said Saturday and Sunday that had to do with our inability to know the truth, our incapacity to know the truth, or perhaps to the effect that nothing that we know is the truth, and therefore that we are not to depend on any truth we know or on any statement of truth we know, that rather in any and every experience that we are to open our consciousness and be receptive to whatever may be imparted to us. This goes back, of course, to the fact that the activity of the human mind cannot reach God. You cannot reach God through the human mind or with the human mind. You cannot embrace God or truth in the human mind. And yet, truth can impart itself to us. But it isn't likely that the fullness of truth can, because of our inability, to receive it. We do not have the capacity to receive the fullness of truth. And therefore, we are receiving facets of truth realizations of truth principles of truth This ties in with the subject of not living on yesterday's manner, not depending on anything you knew yesterday. In other words, if we are in meditation, we certainly are not in meditation to remember something that we have read in books. We are in meditation for the purpose of receiving an impartation from the Father within. And it may come to us in the form of something we have heretofore known in Scripture or spiritual writings. But the point is, that it is coming to us as an impartation of the Spirit, not as an activity of memory. The activity of the human mind is not power, 
in the sense of spiritual power, <clears throat> and all of the knowledge that can be embraced in the human mind, even all the knowledge of truth, is not spiritual power. The knowledge of truth acts to remove from us our ignorance of the nature of spirit and its activities and operations. To illustrate this, when we first come to the study of truth, we believe that God is a great power and that if we can just get God, we are going to have the power that will destroy the earthly errors. And now through our studies, uh, this ignorance is chipped away and we learn to stop looking to God or expecting God to uh, remove the evils of this world. In the same way that as we study, we learn that there is but one power. And here again, we have a help that enables us to stop trying to get a power to do something to another power called evil, sin, disease, death. And with this knowledge of truth, we are enabled to cease that mental activity of uh, expecting a God to overcome our enemies, and we are thereby enabled to relax inwardly and uh, await the realization of grace, the nun power. Every principle of truth that we learn, every principle of truth that we study and practice, develops our consciousness to the place where we can uh, resist not evil, where we can put up the sword, where we can retire into ourselves in an inner peace and thereby become aware of grace. Now, grace is not a power. Grace is a presence. And in the presence of grace, there is no need for any powers because there is nothing of an erroneous nature. When Scripture says, in thy presence is fullness of joy, it certainly indicates that in thy presence there are no sins, diseases, deaths, lacks, or limitations. Otherwise there would be no fullness of joy. So in thy presence, evil of any name or nature cannot function, for it has no existence. And therefore, our studies are all in the direction of bringing us to a place in consciousness in which we can relax, rest, in a state of receptivity, and then eventually hear or feel something that would indicate, fear not, it is I, be not afraid, it is I, nothing shall in any wise come nigh thy dwelling place. And now, see how this must inevitably bring us to a place of resting from taking thought.
the place of realizing I cannot use truth, but if I relax, truth can use me. Truth can function my life. Or Paul, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth my life. But now, if Christ is living my life, I am not thinking or doing. Christ is functioning through me and as me, and it is as it were, I am standing to one side, being a beholder of Christ, <coughs> truth, living my life. As you sit here, listening, at the same time, be relaxing. Let go of any thought and of every thought, and release even the belief that there is anything that you can do about anything. Relax in uh, the sense of, O oh, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. To yourself, remember, be still. Be still and let God be God. And Feel, feel that you could not possibly embrace God in your mind anyhow. Let the activity of the mind be still. Christ liveth my life. God functions my being. Let the whole earth be still. And above all, let my mind be still. Then you will see that whatever activity you are engaged in, business, art, music, healing, inventing, composing, studying, that as you first relax in this, letting the mind that was in Christ Jesus be your mind, then grace will function. Grace will function as wisdom. Grace will function as harmony, as peace. Grace will function as health, as wholeness, as completeness, as inspiration, as the source of knowledge. And it will flow through you, and in you, and as you. We in the Infinite Way work are now approaching the state and stage of consciousness that lives by grace, not by physical might, not by mental power, not by knowledge, but by grace. The knowledge of truth always serves a function in our experience in that it helps us to settle back into this attitude of 
expectancy. But that is the only purpose that knowledge is now serving us, the knowledge of truth. Because actually we are rising above the letter into the spirit. You will notice in all of the talks of 1963 it is emphasized that we are working toward the place of living without words and without thoughts. I mean our spiritual living is without words and without thoughts. And every step of this year has been leading us up to this month where we are actually experiencing grace. That is, the living above the letter, above the law. Just as there are physical laws that operate on the physical plane, mental laws that operate on the mental plane, and in our humanhood we are always living by these laws. Although in our spiritual life we are now living less by the physical laws and more by the mental laws, and then eventually less by the mental laws and more by the absence of law, by grace, because grace transcends all law. The law of self-preservation keeps birds as far away from humans as possible. And it isn't often that you will find birds making friends of humans. And yet, we have a St. Francis who shows us that even this law can be transcended and we can live in such an atmosphere of grace that the birds will come to us and rest on our shoulders, on our head, on our hands. Certainly for the most part, as humans we want to stay as far as possible away from beasts, the wild beasts of the forests. And yet we have witnessed states of grace. Daniel showed us this, and uh, many have been able to prove to us that wild beasts are not always wild beasts. But this would only be true where an individual is above the law and in grace and under grace. And grace is the absence of power, any power. Once you realize that you cannot use spiritual power and that there is a state of grace and you no longer rely on physical or mental powers, you then reach that attitude and altitude of consciousness which is a state of grace a state of non-power, and uh, you discover that what heretofore has been power no longer is power in your experience. <clears throat> that it will uh, probably be a long time before we demonstrate the grace consciousness in its fullest extent is evident by the fact 
that in the Master's resurrection, he still is full of nail wounds and knife wounds and broken bones to show that to that degree at least he is still under physical law. Although even his bones must have mended to enable him to walk. But even if they didn't, he could walk without them being mended by grace. The point is not as to whether or not you can at this moment walk on water. The point is not whether or not you can on purpose swallow a bottle of poison and survive it. That is not the point. The point is that from the moment that you begin to function under grace, law has less and less power over you. And then you will discover that you may be called to those who have swallowed poison and you can bring them through it, or those who have been seriously injured and you can bring them above the uh, whatever the law may be. You must remember this, that to some extent, almost from the beginning of your experience in the in infinite way, you have been under grace for the simple reason that every healing that you have witnessed has been a proof of grace. The law involved has been overcome. If you have had a germ illness, a cold, grip, flu, pneumonia, or any of these things that are caused by germs, and you have had a spiritual healing, it was grace proved that the law was of none effect. The law just could not operate. The law of germs, of infection or contagion, could not operate where your consciousness was present. So it is, any manner of healing, physical, mental, moral, financial, was a proof that the law was not able to function in the presence of your consciousness. It wasn't that your consciousness was a power over the law. It was a proof that the law wasn't a power in the presence of your consciousness of grace. What constituted your consciousness of grace? The fact that you had worked with the principle of one power. The fact that you had worked conscientiously, that you had read it on every page of the books, that you had heard it on every tape, and that gradually your consciousness had come to accept the truth that there is but one power and it is spiritual. There is but one law and it is a spiritual law. Now, as your consciousness accepts this, the law hits up against it out here and uh, like darkness, it just isn't there anymore. That is how... Uh, spiritual consciousness operates. And as a matter of fact, that's how it is formed. It is formed by our awareness, first through the intellect, of these principles. We come to accept God or I or God as my consciousness as the only power. Just think how many of the books pound away at the theme that God is individual consciousness, my consciousness and yours. Now, if God is my consciousness, what chance would anything have operating uh, for evil? Nothing shall in any wise enter that defileth or maketh a lie. Enter what? into God consciousness, into my consciousness if my consciousness is God consciousness. Therefore, as I am working with these writings and being filled with this 
message, this principle, that God constitutes my consciousness and my consciousness is the one and only power, that there is no power external to me, that all power functions from within me and it is only of a spiritual nature. Therefore, it doesn't govern anyone or control anyone or dominate anyone. It is a spiritual law of freedom unto everyone. Now, you are building the consciousness of grace. And then, lo and behold, something comes to your attention of your own, or of your families, or of your patients, or of your students, claiming to be a law. And it touches your consciousness, which is no longer your consciousness, but God consciousness functioning as your consciousness, the one and the only power, therefore the light of the world. And now what happens to darkness? It disappears. And you have not used the power, remember. You have not used the power of truth. You have not used the power of God. You have been the power of truth. You haven't used it. If anything, it has used you. As we continue to abide in the principles that have been given to us in this message, and you will notice the fact that there are no contradictory ones, every principle of this message agrees as to God being individual consciousness, as to God or I or this consciousness being the infinite and only power, substance, law, cause and effect. Every principle that becomes part of our consciousness constitutes the reborn consciousness. And the old man or the old consciousness that believed in two powers, that feared two powers, that used one power over another power, that is the old man who is dying. That is the old consciousness that is being educated out of itself. And as this old man with his belief in two powers, in the law, as he dies out, this new consciousness is reborn until eventually, and this should be the year in which uh, our activity takes on this complexion, until we now rise above the law into a consciousness of grace in which we are not thinking in terms of power, we are not thinking in terms of overcoming, we are not thinking in terms of words or thoughts. We are living, we are being, and we are letting the divine consciousness flow through us and animate us and live our lives for us. Of course, we have the Ten Commandments to tell us what to do and what not to do. And up to a certain extent, we succeeded with them in attaining at least a goodly measure of obedience to them. And then we found the Sermon on the Mount, and we went a step further. But in all of this, remember, we were still living our lives. We were still trying to love our neighbor as ourselves. We were still trying to be philanthropic. We were still trying to forgive our enemies. We were still trying to improve ourselves. But at this point, that stops. At this point, we are living by grace. And it is the grace of God that functions through us as benevolence or purity 
or kindliness or whatever qualities, integrity, whatever it is that functions through us, we are now enabled to say with the Master, why callest thou me good? Why callest thou me spiritual? It is a state of grace that is functioning. I haven't any power over being good or bad. I haven't any power to be good or bad. I haven't any power to be spiritual or unspiritual. I haven't any power to be charitable or not charitable. Whatever it is that's functioning through me, that is what I must be. And it is not I being it. I live yet not I. Christ liveth my life. That, that sense of I has moved over to where it is really nothing but a beholder of life. It is always beholding and marveling at what things the Father is doing. But it is not participating, beholding, beholding. It beholds sometimes with sadness. There was a newspaper article last week about a man in some state of health incurable, in which even his family said, it's too bad, but it must be so. And uh, some infinite way students immediately wrote me, please save this man. Please do something. You must do something for this man. Well, now, as if I would withhold it, or as if I could withhold it, but my answer was, what makes you think God wouldn't do it if God were turned to? And if God isn't turned to, what makes you think I can do it? Not that I would withhold it. Do you see the point? And this is what the beholder sometimes witnesses, those who could be helped. But... Uh, aren't being, and must go on in the feeling that even God can't help. Well, so we witness, sadly, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, I would. I would take you under my wing, <coughs> but ye would not. And so the beholder sees this world and says, oh, it would be so easy to have world peace. It would be so easy with all of God's wealth that's in this world to have abundance for everybody. But ye would not. And so you stand by praying that consciousness be opened to receive grace to rise above this law of power. And now remember, it is only that word power that is a stumbling block. Because we are always seeking a power, and when we are, we are seeking a power to overcome something or destroy something. And thereby, we are not living in the awareness of God. Because in the, the realization of the presence of God, there is no power necessary to overcome, to destroy, to do anything. Some people act as if we need God power to increase the supply of this world. The supply of this world, and I'm speaking human supply, is already infinite. There is already more 
of what is necessary for food and clothing and housing than the entire world could consume, and it is being renewed faster than it is being used. There is no need to turn to God for greater supply. There is only need for ourselves to be willing to share the supply we already have. And so it is. The world prays to God for peace. God has no peace to give. God is not withholding any peace. Peace must be established in the consciousness of an individual or a, the individuals of the world. God's peace is already established on earth. If you and I are not at peace with each other, God can do nothing about it. It lies within you and me to decide what it is that will establish peace. God is not withholding peace. Peace is established and it is a state of grace. And it functions in that moment when I am demanding nothing of you. In that moment when I am real realizing that God's grace is my sufficiency in all things. And there is a sufficiency of God's grace omnipresent to meet the need of this moment. In that moment I free you. In the moment that you can feel that I have freed you you are at peace with me. Because, as you will discover, the only reason for a lack of peace is the fear that we have of each other, the fear of what the other may want of us, individually or collectively, nationally or internationally. It is that one fear and the only antidote is the realization that since I and my father are one, I have a hidden manner. I have a hidden source of supply that is not dependent on man whose breath is in his nostril. It is not dependent on anyone's goodwill. And as I can relax in that, in some perfectly normal and natural way, that supply unfolds. And it is not merely a supply of money, because it isn't only money or land that causes people to war with each other. People are at war with each other within their own families, not over money and not over land. But there is always something that one is demanding of another that is causing the breach. And the healing can only take place in release. And release can only come, you can only release when that state of grace has come to you. And you realize that you no longer need powers. Your oneness with God is your assurance of omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. Therefore, you release anybody and everybody. This might be called forgiving, but it's a better way of approaching it because forgiving is difficult. Forgiving is the acknowledgement of an actual wrong done, and we're supposed to, in some way, forget it, which is pretty difficult. But it is far easier to see that the reason that this was done to me was because I was expecting something else and I had no right to be expecting anything. So in the beginning it was my fault. I brought it on myself. I expected something of you. Therefore you did to me what I'm having a hard time forgiving. 
But if I had not expected that of you, I'd have nothing now to forgive. We could be at peace. Do you think? So it is that under the law of self-preservation, you can see how we injure each other and do things to each other, all because we're trying to protect ourselves or save ourselves at somebody else's expense. Also, you can see how we have been taught certain things as law which weren't law. And we've come under the belief of that law. For instance, the Hebrews once taught that the sins of the fathers will be visited on the children unto the third and fourth generation. And you must know that the Hebrews for centuries were under that law. Well, only two centuries, fortunately, because <coughs> two centuries later, a prophet revealed, you are no longer under this law. This law no longer operates. Each is under the penalty of their own thoughts and deeds. And no longer can the thoughts and deeds of another operate against you. Now all of a sudden you're released from the sins of your parents and of your grandparents. And now you are turned within and you realize, aha, a few centuries from now Paul is going to say, if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap life everlasting. So it is my sowing. And so we better get ready for Paul and prepare ourselves now so that by the time Paul says this to us, we can say, Brother Paul, it's all right. We're ahead of you. We learned from our Hebrew ancestors that we are not under the law of domination. We are not under the law of anyone else's mental powers, sins, or fears. That we have to go within our own consciousness and establish ourselves. And in what way? Either under the law or under grace. Well, if it's to be under the law, If we just wait a few centuries, we're going to be told that sitting in a draft or getting our feet wet will give us a cold, and the cold might give us pneumonia, and the pneumonia might cause our death. If we're patient enough, we will learn that that wasn't law. Do you see what I'm driving at? Always we are prisoners of the mind. Mankind is a prisoner of the mind and he is a prisoner of laws which sooner or later will be revealed to us as not being law at all. Therefore, we, centuries ahead of these revelations, are becoming aware of the fact that the law is only law while it is accepted in your mind as law. Whether it's the law of heredity, the law of ancestry, the law of racial belief, or even now, <clears throat> the law of karma. If the law of as ye sow, so shall ye reap is valid, the karmic law is valid. Think what the United States has coming to it from its uh, throwing of atomic bombs. Now try to think what law it has brought itself under. And if you are a good American who approves of this, you are under that law. But of course, I am showing you now that you are not under that law because it isn't a law. That is only a law to those who accept it as a law. 
and who accept patriotism as a law, my country right or wrong. Do you see that? But actually, this karmic law cannot operate except to those who are prisoners of the mind and accept that law. For this reason, if you are abiding in grace, there is no law. You've proven for 90 years of metaphysics that sitting in a draft and getting wet feet wasn't a law. You've proved with 90 years of metaphysics that the germs that cause colds and grip and flu is not a law. You have proved by the healing of tuberculosis, cancer, consumption, and many, many other things that what is accepted as law is not law. Is not law to those under grace. Because remember, it was only the practitioners or teachers who could prove that. Therefore, the law is the law to those who are still prisoners of the mind and live by the law. But the law is not the law to those under grace, to those who are abiding above the letter, above the law, without words, without thoughts, abiding morning to night, night to morning, abiding in this realization, I and my father are one. Now what can touch that oneness? If I and my father are one, what can touch God? Is there a law of matter or of mind that can touch God? And so if we say I and the father are one, then I am that one. And that is the one that is not man, a spiritual being. And this, you see, removes you from every religious teaching of which you now have any knowledge. You are not man. You do not have to be forgiven. I and the Father are one, and that one is spirit. That one is life eternal. Individually, it is known as the Christ self, or spiritual self, which I am, not which I will be by reading books. The reading of the books will tell me that I am. And then I have to turn from the books in meditation and attain the realization that I am. Our studies of the knowledge of truth, the letter of truth, is to lead us back into the kingdom of God within ourselves where we tabernacle with our inner selves and receive therefrom the assurance, be not afraid, it is I. Thou art I. I am thou. Oh, then I am under grace. Not under the law, under grace. And there is no law touching the grace that I am that does not dissolve. Now, do you see that what I started out to say and what I have been saying these last two days and to which I have been leading up throughout this whole year of talks, Sunday talks, is that you now arrive at a place above words and thoughts, above using any truth to just abiding in stillness, in quietness, in peace, 
without words, without thoughts. And if there are any words or thoughts to come, let them come from the divine grace, from the Father within, from the source. When the Master says, I have overcome the world, he really means the law cannot function. The laws cannot function. I am living in a state of grace where there are no laws. And I can see that the laws can operate only in the minds of those who are accepting laws. To whom you render yourself servants, he you must obey. The law or grace? Will you serve God or mammon? Oh, it doesn't mean serving God and money as such. But are you letting the world of effect be the law unto you? Is money going to be your God? Is the law of health going to be your God? Is anything in the realm of effect going to be power? Or are you realizing there are no powers? There are no powers. Through this, eventually, you will be able to look down into the universal mind, which is the mind of mankind. And you will see how enslaved it is. And how that entire slavery is within itself. For instance, one man uh, has to pass through a bar room and he almost has to run through. Uh, he's in such fear of those bottles there and of what's in them and that he may pick one up and drink it. He, he has to rush through to get away from it. Okay? It's in his mind. It isn't in the bottle because we walk right through that same room and we don't even see the bottles that are up there. We've gone all the way from the front entrance to the back entrance and haven't even been aware that such things were there. Even if the physical eye saw them, we weren't aware of them because they weren't uh, in the mind as a power. And uh, you will see what it is in this person's mind and that person's mind that's making them a prisoner of the mind, holding them in fear in bondage to something that's in the mind. One fellow, it's gambling. He just can't rest while he has a dollar in his pocket. He has got to gamble it away. And why? The attraction isn't out there because it doesn't attract most of the people of the world. It only attracts the few who are prisoners to that particular form. And so it is that there's the fellow gambling in Wall Street. He's just as much a victim of gambling as the fellow at the ten-cent dice table. And if you can look down, you'll see what's animating him and pushing him. <coughs> he is not aware of it. He's a victim of it. And so it is you learn never to condemn Never, because that person who is afflicted with the $2 racetrack bet or the fellow with a $100,000 Wall Street bet or the fellow with the alcohol bet or the drug bet or the sex bet or some, he's a victim. He, he is not the sinner. He's the victim. And... Uh, He's a prisoner of his own mind. And you can only free him when he's ready to be freed, when he appeals for it, when he asks for it. You can only free him 
by being free yourself. The fact that you yourself recognize grace and not law. And then as you sit in a complete silence, without any thought, and always remember this in your treatment work. Don't be concerned if you don't get thoughts. Don't be concerned if no truth comes to you. You are not the actor. You are not the healer. The concern is not yours. You are relaxing yourself into grace. Grace is going to do the work. You are merely going to be the instrument of grace. Therefore, you sit down and uh, whether the disease is physical, mental, moral, financial, or human relationships, don't struggle around to know any truths. Don't struggle around to give advice. Be still. I within am God. So just be still and let I be God. And relax in that grace that realizes <coughs> law is not power. The law of the mind is not power. The law of beliefs is not power. Grace reveals the none power. Grace reveals the none power. Grace reveals the presence of grace reveals the, pre the none presence of power, of law. And so, as long as you can abide in that inner stillness, do not be concerned whether you have words or thoughts, because it might well be that you have gone beyond that place of needing words and thoughts. Because words and thoughts, remember, are part of that activity of the mind. And what we are trying to do is rise above the activity of the mind into grace. In quietness and in stillness. Is the presence of grace. In thy presence. The presence of stillness, quietness, peace. Is fulfillment. Divine harmony. You see, you are at the place now of not overcoming, not destroying, not removing. This year, all of us in the infinite way must pass out of the state of mind that's overcoming and rising above and destroying and into this realization of grace that is the light which reveals no darkness. It doesn't remove it. It doesn't send it any place. It reveals non-presence. And so those who come to you with sin or disease or lack, don't, don't try to do something to them or for them. Be that state of grace which reveals the non-presence. Where it went to or how or when, you, you have no idea, and don't try, because you'll be trying to use your mind again. And do not think for a minute that this will destroy your mind, because your mind will always have its function as the avenue of awareness. All that you are doing is stopping the false activity of making a power out of your mind, which it was never meant to be in the beginning. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. In the moment that ye think not, the bridegroom cometh. Now, you are not to destroy your mind. You're not to give it up. You're not to surrender it. You are to allow it to settle into its normal function of an avenue of awareness. Through my mind, I know that you are here. Through my mind, I am speaking to you. Through my mind... All of this is functioning. See that? But I'm not using my mind to be a power to destroy your errors. Just think the truth is infinite 
and then see how terrible it would be to try to grasp truth. Think how, how, how much uh, you would be proving if the thought came to you or someone asked you, what is truth, if you could smile like the master and turn on your heel and walk away, as if anybody could know what truth is. Who could know what truth is? I am the truth. Well, now go and define what I am or who I am. Impossible. So the closer you get to that place where your, your mind isn't busy seeking around for some truth, the sooner you will see that truth keeps pouring itself through you. From the source. Not a made-up truth. Not a formula truth. Thing. Not a truth that somebody wrote. It, it, it's truth, all right. Otherwise, the mystics wouldn't have received it. It's truth. But it is the truth that you know to help build you up to where you receive the truth. Thank you.